understanding is that the script, uh, when you first wrote the script, you titled it Militia and no one would touch it. <laughs> that, that's accurate, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's accurate. So how did you get people to touch it? What was the idea? <laughs> like, uh, how did you get this movie made? We changed the title uh, a number of times, but it really was just coming down to talking to everybody involved, whether it was the actors, the producers, or anybody, just knowing that this was actually just a very simple human universal conflict story that takes place in a group you would otherwise not have a lot of access to. And it's sort of taking an empathetic emotional point of view and putting it in people you kind of judge from the outside. And having that contrast play out was just more cinematic and sort of a more interesting reversal to me than dramatizing a stereotype as a stereotype. And what and what sort of inspired you to tackle the subject matter particularly? It just all starts with the protagonist and thinking about a character who is just hell-bent on being alone, realizing that they might have to go back to something like a group who meant this one's hurting them. Just because human connection is such a powerful force and you need it so bad that you might end up being a part of something that you don't even really want to just because it's better than being by yourself. I'd love to hear from the cast in terms of what their feelings were when confronted with the script of these characters. Sir? <laughs> you guys want to? Henry wrote a really tight script, and um, I, I think we all just showed up, and we showed up with a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, willingness to work and go in different directions and trust his vision. Um, you know, at the same time, I think we also want to have a lot of fun. And, uh, and uh, I think, you know, was there a room for spontaneity in, in the in the in the production in terms of, or was it? It seems like such a like as you said, tight screenplay that's so precise and, des and decisive, which is, I feel like, it, it's, it's something that definitely appealed to me as a viewer, but as an actor, was that something that really excited you too? Like you just been willing to sink your teeth into these lines, in this dialogue? Yeah, there's a lot of dialogue, man. There's a lot of meat to, to dip into, man. And like, like what we had to discover is that Henry has a very specific stylistic point of view of what we're trying to do. And, and our playground, instead of using all these actor tricks that we all have, where we go this way, we go that way, we go this way, suddenly your trick is here. And you better have the range right here. And you have to learn how to expand on that, you know? And then like, I work with a pack of ninjas, man. These guys are awesome, man. I love these guys to death. Was it, was it chronological? The, the, the other thing that is so clear is that from scene one to the end, the tension is mounting on the cast. Like every, everyone, the pressure is beginning to pile on. And so I wonder how, how do you organize and manage that pressure as a director and then also as a cast to remember at what state am I supposed to be in in terms of how, how anxious and how nervous I feel? Well, the sort of gifts and curse of it taking what felt like a while, but in the movie industry is light speed and getting it made in three years was it gave me time to do the prep. And since we were so indie and so low budget, you know, we didn't have money for a storyboard artist or previous, so I just drew the movie first. And so it's five books of about 300 pages of storyboards, making sure that I know where every single visual is gonna be. And so there's no really room left to, not discover, because that's great too on set, but you, you don't wanna get to set a movie like this and wing it. You wanna get there and paint by numbers as it may be. So having that ahead of time was also really helpful because these guys were coming on board for a first time director for a pretty touchy subject matter. And you want to show them that you've thought about these things ahead of time, that you're not kind of just winging it with stuff that deserves a delicate touch. Were there any big questions from the cast at any point in terms of where you were taking the characters or the story? Why they couldn't move more was a big thing. I was like, let's just get you right there, and it would be right here, and, and everything like that. But um, no, I mean, it was like Bash said. It was it was really lucky that we had a a crew of guys where it would just be, you know, Jackson was a, was my friend and my great DP. I could trust him that we would go. Okay, here's where it feels right. Here's what we're gonna do. And while he's lighting, we go outside for about five minutes, and I'm like, I think it's like this, and Bash would be like. What if we do it like that? And I'm like, all right, great. And we went back inside and we had, you know, a lot of this, you're looking at one to two takes max because we just didn't have time. And so again, it's a testament to the actors just being there and they were so on point. 
that I could go like, all right, I pretty much got it after one. And if we go to three, that just means that I want options in the cut. Um, so yes and no, I answer your question. Editorially, did, did things change much at all? Did you know? Um, <laughs> you just are a man with a plan. I mean, no, it was, it was really, it was funny. My editor, Josh, and I became, as you do, you get really close because we're just spending so much time together. And we had a cut of the movie, I think 10 days into the edit. Like we had a, we had a full like 100 minute cut. It was, it was okay. And it was like, we were, we were watching it and I was just like, well, we don't like it. There's, there are so few takes per setup, like, we're kind of fucked. <laughs> so, so it was good just having so much great raw material that I could kind of sculpt from and operate from a, all right, let's get the broad strokes down first so the emotional through line is there and the story is set. So that then our remaining time we can just spend on kind of digging into my new show and finding, you know, the right blink out of badge for things or the right you know, gesture from happy that felt like, okay, that's where he's at because it's such a, it's a movie visually where it magnifies the small stuff. Like when someone is trying to, I found, and I always think, when I watch somebody who's being truthful and they're trying to be told something, they don't indicate, they try not to. And so we would find these little moments with these guys where it was just like, it was there in a gesture. And that was really lucky, just having this, you know, my editor and I had a great relationship with being on the same page. So again, we just worked really fast. Like we wrapped five and a half months ago like shooting, and yeah, it was it was lucky. It was just a great team. I should mention this Josh, the Josh you're referring to is a Midnight Madness alumni. He is. You're with yeah. almost human in the mind's eye. Yes. <laughs> Do we have questions for the audience? Yes, right there. which you don't get to say all the time as a producer. Um, Dallas Sorry, and, hang, on, hang on one second. The question was simply, how difficult was this kind of movie to produce? Uh, yeah, so, so a lot of it was really a pleasure, you know, uh, working alongside Dallas is wonderful. Uh, you don't always get a director who walks in with a 300 page tome knowing exactly what they want to do. That's a real blessing. Um, and shooting in Dallas, Texas is really a treat. Uh, that's where we made this movie and you know, people there really have their arms wide open to making movies, and so, you know, we got our warehouses in a, in a way and at a budget that you wouldn't anywhere else, so that was great. The team was wonderful, and, you know, we, we almost wrapped every day at 12 hours or less, which is insane as well, and, and that's a testament to Henry, to the actors, and to our first AD, to Jackson. You know, it was really a treat. Was it all one location, or did you stitch them together? Uh, two and change. There's one uh, warehouse that was the interior with all of the lumber, and then one warehouse that was the exterior with all of the loading bay doors, and then uh, Gannon's trailer out in that field. Other questions? Other questions? Yes, right there. The question is regarding the tactic, the interrogation tactics and the militia tactics. What kind of research did you do in, in sort of assembling uh, and laying out those tactics? Well, the short answer is no. Uh, you know, I think it's really important when you're telling a story like this, the main thing is simplicity and cinematic. And to keep it simple where it's something like these people being on lockdown, looking at this radio thing, that is an untraceable form of technology just because it's so almost old school now. And those things can be kind of honed in on. But truthfully, my job is to always be what is the most simple, emotionally powerful way for the audience to follow along versus sort of drowning them in minutia and fact checking. Because it just felt like, all right, we can make a documentary about this, or we can make it entertaining and fast. And I'm always going to go for the latter. Speaking to the cast, were there any times that you guys felt you wanted uh, to do that research? Did you do some any, any research on your own for your characters uh, at all, in terms of 
police tactics or how you felt, you know? I mean, was there, was there guns? Let me you? wait, Dennis, sorry, just to, uh, just to go back to that point. The police interview interrogation techniques, mm -hmm. that was researched heavily. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of great books on interrogation tactics and how it's all about not proving the person did it, but getting them to come to your side and want to be a team together and getting that to be more of a almost friendship between two people. And we talked so much about it, about there's these buy signs when somebody's moving, like when Badge and Morris are going off, there's all these kind of subtle buy signs that indicates a person is ready to come to your side, they're ready to join you and, and take the deal, so to speak. And then when Rob and Badge went to, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe because Rob's character sort of challenges him on a more of an intellectual kind of physical level. I gave I gave Rob this book that I was really into. And he showed up to Seth with that book and had read it and highlighted it and underscored everything way more than I had and was coming up to me with the script and was like, actually on page 26, you did this wrong. I actually would do this this way. And I was like, I respect that. Okay, cool. And so Rob actually found tactics where I was just like, fuck. This is the guy who gets the character because he's doing it in real life. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. I just need to say this. My interrogation coach on this film was Robert Aramayo. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me everything I know. <laughs> yes, right there. The question was, is considering there are so few takes at times, uh, was there a rehearsal period? What was the process like, take by take? You want me to take this one, guys? Uh, we, again, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a two-prong answer, which is we shot in such a small amount of time, but we still were able to get, I think, two days of table reads and one-on-ones and talking about the scenes which is not common even for a big movie. Sometimes you just show up on set and it's like, here's your lines, there's your mark. And these guys were all in on it ahead of time that was just a huge gift to me because I got to talk about scenes with the actors and make sure that everybody was clear on intention and if somebody had a better move, I would just be like, okay, it's kind of a meritocracy, like whatever is best for the movie wins. And there wasn't one actor who didn't come to me with something to just go, this can be better if we sort of massage this beat or this intention or this movement. And I, yeah, I think that was just, again, a testament to Dallas and Amanda for even giving it to me. It's, it's not common, but to have that table read that rehearsal time, even at 48 hours, is, that's a luxury. Do you remember something significant? Was there a big, any, any things that kind of changed the course of the production from those table reads? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm not being yeah. flippant about it. It was just, there. it was, again, it was doing the heavy lifting kind of on the script frees everybody up to go, okay, let, what's what's fun in the minutia of the character versus having to, you know, restructure somebody who didn't do their homework. Right there? Let me go one more after that. Um the question was whether or not uh, when Henry wrote the script was there anything he did to ensure that he would direct the film? Because the film was in, on the blacklist and sometimes those scripts get picked up, but they don't, the writer doesn't come with it. Yeah, I, I think my intention had always been to write and direct it. Um, and I know that isn't enough most of the time, but I had done a short that had done really well. It was sort of similar, almost like a narrative cousin of this, where it was very warehouse based, it's very dialogue driven. It's basically like a stage play. And having that background kind of gave me the completely unearned confidence to go into these meetings and just be like, no, I'm directing it. And they would just be like, who are you? And I was like, I'm Henry. Like, we don't care. Who, why, why are you saying this so confidently? And I was like, don't know, just doing it. Um, and that, that, I don't know, it's, it's, I've heard it a number of times where it's really just being like, no, I'm going to do this. And then sort of following up on it and doing your work. I hope that answered your question. One more question if someone has it, and I have one if no one does. Yes, oh, right there, sorry. Um, let, let's do both, because you guys are very interested. Thanks, thanks. Character actors, uh, as a viewer, I just want to thank all of you for making it, for number one, not a four hour movie. Uh, a movie that you didn't want to end. Uh, I've been sitting through all my badge as an interrogator. I almost wanted to jump up and say I did it myself. <laughs> 
Do you have a question to say? <laughs> very great comment. Very great comments. Very great comments. But do you have a question? Yeah. Excellent. I love the scene with the Gannon and the Dowager at the Keep kidding. Writing specifically that one monologue. That, that, that. Well, I only try and work on stuff that freaks me out and scares me. And a lot of that is just being like, okay, I have been in lonely places in my life, and at those points I tried to justify it. And I was like, okay, if that's what this character would be thinking, he'd be thinking of every positive way that you could turn this to make it sort of self-righteous in a way. But that's not enough. The turn comes when he starts to say, but it's a complete lie. It's just pretentious and no one gives a shit. And at the end of the day, you are just someone who is banished and forcing the character, first and foremost, to go. The most painful truth sometimes is admitting our own. And his at that point is saying, I left, but no one gives a shit. No one cares. And that was something that I talked to Badge a lot about, where we were just like, this is me being honest on the page about things that freak me out, and him being willing to go there kind of with me, so to speak. As far as how long it took, I mean, I wrote the first draft of this seven years ago. Um, granted, it was a very different script, but this version, I don't know, that probably took two months to write. Yeah. Thank you. Put your hands together. Stand up.